Good morning, William. Good morning. Uh, thanks for taking uh, the time to, to answer some, some of my questions. I know uh, how, how busy you must be right now, so that's uh, much um, appreciated. Fine. I'm ready to go. <laughs> okay. I want you obviously to talk about what's happening here, what's been happening in, in Gaza for the last, I don't know how many weeks now, maybe eight weeks. Um, you actually made a very strong statement, and I will read it, it's very short, um, to the US court in support of the Center for Constitutional Rights lawsuit against Joe Biden for aiding and abetting genocide. Uh, the statement goes as follows. I conclude that there is a serious risk of genocide committed against the Palestinian population of Gaza and that the United States of America is in breach of its obligation under both the 1948 Genocide Convention, to which it is a party, as well as customary international law, to use its position of, influ of influence within the government of Israel and to take the best measures within its power to prevent the crime taking place. So first I wanted to ask you, you know, as a genocide expert, legal expert, how do, you, how do you analyze the potential elements of, of genocide when it comes to the current situation? Well, let me say at the outset that actually the, the sentence you've read is, is the concluding paragraph in quite a lengthy legal opinion that I submitted um, on for the Center for Constitutional Rights in this case that they filed uh, against basically against the United States, although it's against individuals who are named Biden and Lincoln and Austin. Um, and that case is going to court, I think, for the first stage anyway, in a hearing uh, late in January. Um, there are two prongs to it. One is the uh, the issue of the, of the duty to prevent genocide, and the other is the issue of complicity in genocide. So there are two separate claims, and my opinion is, is related to the first of the two. It's about a, a real uh, threat, a serious threat of genocide. This is a, uh, an interpretation of the Genocide Convention that was developed by the International Court of Justice um, more than 15 years ago in its uh, celebrated judgment in a case between Bosnia and Serbia. And it said that Serbia, although it was not an accomplice in the genocide committed at Srebrenica was nevertheless in a position of influence uh, and should have done, should have taken measures to attempt to prevent it uh, by exercising the influence that it had over the Bosnian Serbs who were responsible for the atrocity committed at Srebrenica. Um, quite recently, as I point out in the opinion, uh, in a submission to the International Court of Justice in, a real, in another case, also under the Genocide Convention, which is the case filed by Ukraine against Russia, the United States government basically endorsed that thesis of the International Court of Justice. It's the interpretation of the International Court of Justice about the prevention of genocide. So uh, basically my argument is that, in, in, and what I try to demonstrate, is that the U.S. is in an analogous position uh, with regard to Israel as Serbia was to uh, the Bosnian Serbs in 19, in 2000, well, in 1995, when the Srebrenica massacre took place. That's the sort of legal dimension. I don't think that there's a, uh, a serious quarrel about the idea, about the content of the judgment and the notion that a state with influence has a duty uh, to exercise its influence, even extraterritorially, and unilaterally, because these are two features of what the International Court of Justice said. It said it's a it's a burden on an individual state where it can have some influence. And of course, it operates outside its territory. It's about things it's to do outside its its territory. Um, so I don't think that there's much dispute. And certainly the United States has endorsed that approach. So the the only other the other issue is the whether there's a serious risk of genocide. I wrote this opinion, uh, I think early in November, if my memory serves me, late October, or early November, 
now we're talking on the uh, 13th, 14th of uh, 13th of of December. And I think the evidence is even more compelling today than it was a month ago uh, th about the serious risk of genocide taking place. I was basing it largely on statements at the time by Israeli officials saying, you know, we're going to cut off the water, the electricity, the medical, uh, the food, the, the medical uh, support and so on to Gaza and knowing that Gaza was sealed in, that it was impossible for the people of Gaza to escape. And also that the uh, Israelis had um, encouraged Palestinians to leave the northern part of Gaza and Gaza City. And of course, that's become much more acute now. It wasn't so obvious both what the consequences would be of that at the time and uh, the duration. But there's another feature that I think is, is relevant uh, as well now. Um, when the Israelis, uh, when the IDF or the Israeli government announced back in October that Palestinians should clear out of the northern part of Gaza, it was it was based on what was ostensibly a humanitarian objective. We, they were saying, this is going to be a battle zone. We're going to be going in and fighting. Get out of the way because we're going in because our goal is to crush Hamas, to defeat and destroy Hamas. And to me, it's become increasingly clear that the goal of the Israelis is not principally to go and defeat and destroy Hamas. Um, they they urge the Palestinians to leave the north. Then they've gone into Gaza City and reduced much of it to rubble. Um, they've made it, by the way, easier to defend for fighters inside, uh, but they're not going in and fighting it. They're surrounding Gaza City. They continue to bombard it. They bombard civilian, basically what are civilian objects, whether they're hospitals, homes, all in the name of trying to facilitate getting at Hamas, which they say are buried underground in tunnels. But then they don't go in and fight for them. If they did, we would see a, a very significant number of Israeli casualties. Today, an Israeli official, or it's in, the, in one of the, I think in the Guardian today, something that corresponds to other reports, they've had something like 140 combat deaths since the 7th of October. They had a larger number on the 7th of October. Since then, a relatively small number. And it, it indicates that they're actually not going in and fighting with Hamas. They're just bombing and targeting the population centers. And so this, I think, makes even more compelling the suggestion that actually their goal is not militarily defeating Hamas, but rather cleansing, to use that term, ethnically cleansing deporting, displacing the civilian population of Gaza towards the south, and of course, obviously towards the south, because the hope is that at some point there'll be a little opening in that frontier between Egypt and Gaza, and Palestinians will then flee, uh, never to return. And that's their goal. And so this is what we would call uh, colloquially ethnic cleansing. I believe that that's what's underway. I think that that's increasingly, the evidence is increasingly strong that that is the real objective of Israel rather than militarily defeating Hamas. If the Palestinians leave Gaza, there'll be no more Hamas to, to, to fight with. They, they, Hamas will, have lost, will lose interest in Gaza if they, if, they, if they leave the territory. So, so that's the goal. And ethnic cleansing, although it's not, it doesn't, it's not identical to genocide, genocide requires uh, evidence of a, an attempt to destruct, to destroy the group, and not just to displace the group. Nevertheless, um, ethnic cleansing often leads to genocide. It leads to genocide because the ethnic cleanser gets frustrated and realizes that the deportation isn't working, and they have to destroy the group. And to me, that creates a serious risk of genocide, which is, again, imposes the duty on the United States to take action to prevent it. Um, perhaps the United States will argue, I mean, that, that they are trying to restrain Israel. But this is an assessment we can make. Again, I'm not in a position to uh, to judge all of that, but whether the occasional um, rapping on the on the you know on the knuckles of by Biden of Netanyahu amounts to 
preventing genocide. I noted that I think yesterday or today, Biden made a declaration referring to indiscriminate bombing by by Israel. This is a this is a huge allegation. Um, and uh, he ought to know they have the intelligence services. They they provide they by the way, they provide the bombs that are part of doing the indiscriminate bombing. Um, so, you know, in the past, I've been in lectures talking about indiscriminate nature of the attack or equally bad or even worse that they're actually targeted at civilian objects, which seems to be largely the case. Uh, but now I, I people would then quarrel saying that I'm imagining things. Now I can just say President Biden. Can, can I ask you something, Bill, because you, you said a lot, actually, um, but um, there's two different things, right? There is preventing genocide, which is an obligation uh, on the part of, of states that have signed, I think, the Genocide Convention, and maybe those that didn't sign it also have a duty to prevent it. Yes. But in a way, what the US case is about is not only preventing genocide, it's about aiding and abetting genocide. So can you explain why uh, CCR, the Center for Constitutional Rights, has gone further than just saying they're not preventing genocide, uh, to actually they are in a way complicit. The US is complicit in the genocide. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm not in, directly involved in that part of the case. My opinion was for the first prong of the argument, which is about the, the obligation to prevent genocide. Um, there's a growing volume of, uh, of, um, of support for the idea that genocide is being committed or has already been committed. Um, it's a very challenging thing to prove to an established to to a high level of evidence there uh, there are a lot of allegations of genocide not just in the palestinian context but um many others the 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 uh, yazidi in syria the rohingya in myanmar um in uh, the tigray in ethiopia uh, i mean there are many allegations of it and sometimes un Commissions of inquiry and rapporteurs say there are uh, reasonable grounds to believe, but these are low levels of evidence. And I, I think maybe something meets that threshold. But to to win a case in court, you have to prove at a, at quite a high level that that uh, you know the the, the 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 level of proof to 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 convince a court that the crime has been committed or is being committed is quite high now so i i don't know what all the evidence will be and how the judge will react to that in the united states if the case gets to that stage it may be the case may be thrown out on um on grounds unrelated to the merits of the claim um you know it's a pretty bold thing to take the president of your country to court and expect the judge to condemn them for uh, being an accomplice in an atrocity so i i don't know i don't understand enough about how the u.s law works to predict the outcome of it, I think more generally in the in the what I call the community of people who are campaign campaigning about this, um, you can devote an awful lot of energy to trying to win the argument that something is genocide rather than a war crime or a crime against humanity. And my tendency is generally to think that it's probably not always worth all that effort. Um, a lot of that energy can be devoted. To building the case where we have really solid evidence, like war crimes, um, you know, we've, as I mentioned, um, uh, indiscriminate attacks on on uh, where there are civilians is a war crime, undoubtedly. And uh, so I just, you know, be more focused on trying to get that one into court and, and calling President Biden as the first witness, the expert witness on the subject. Um, I wanted to ask you also, because you, you've researched and studied genocide for decades, um, what's happening now in your opinion? Is it what some people like Raz Segal have, have called a, a textbook case of genocide? Or do you think it could be a, a new type in a way of genocide in the making? And in a way, the, the follow-up question would be, um, what gravity has to do with it? Do you have? Could you have different levels of genocide depending on the on the gravity of it? You know. I mean, this is all sort of speculative, legal, you know, cre creative legal interpretation. 
um, that may or may not get some traction um, in the in the legal world, which means convincing judges, expert bodies, treaty bodies, and so on. Um, in the case of genocide, we we don't have a treaty body, as they call it, to interpret the crime of genocide. And generally, people are very reliant on the uh, interpretations by the International Court of Justice and by the Yugoslavian Rwanda tribunals, which did a lot of, you know, have done a lot of serious reflecting on the definition of genocide. They've adopted an approach to it, which is um, somewhat strict, stricter than many would have, have liked. But this is an established, it's pretty established and pretty consistent. It's not as if there's a huge variation and a great debate in the in, in that legal community about the definition of genocide. In the, you know, going more broadly, there's a great deal of, of and, and use of the term genocide in a what I sometimes call a more colloquial context outside of the context of of interpreting the genocide convention. Um, I don't have any problem with people doing that as long as they make it clear that they're not talking about about the genocide convention. You know, we often do that with words. We have a torture convention and we have the word torture and we often use the word torture. I, you know, somebody goes to the shoe store and they buy a pair of shoes that don't fit right. And they talk about how their feet, they were tortured, but it was torture to walk in those shoes. Nobody suggests that they go to the Committee Against Torture of the United Nations or file a claim with the of war crimes with the International Criminal Court. So I think this is one of the problems when we're talking about genocide. At the beginning of the Ukraine conflict in 2022, again, President Biden, after going to meet some farmers in Iowa, was asked this by a journalist, and he said, yeah, it looks like genocide to me. But I think that if we'd asked Biden to define genocide, it probably would not have been, it would not have closely resembled the definition in the 1948 Convention on Genocide. So I think that's the problem with these innovative approaches, the idea that it's a new form of genocide. You know, we're talking about, about something that, I, I don't see that there's room for new forms of genocide in the definition of the convention, which is also the definition in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, as it now stands. But that's not an obstacle to people using the term at all. And what what can and should, in a way, other courts and other institutions be doing to actually prevent the the genocide, if, if it is genocide, continuing? Well, the, the prevention, as I said, doesn't require that there be genocide. It requires that there be a serious risk of genocide taking place. Uh, um, you know, the question then is, what can you order states to? First of all, they can stop providing aid. They can vote the right way in the General Assembly and in the Security Council. Um, but it is, we are talking, especially because if we're talking about what states do individually or what courts order them to do, perhaps, um, is that we're not talking about the use of force. It has to be, it has to be lawful what they do. So it's strong diplomatic financial pressure. I mean, aside from having the biggest army in the world and the more aircraft carriers, I think, than the rest of the world put together, the United States can inflict serious pain on a country financially. Uh, and they do it, by the way. There are many victims of U.S. sanctions around the world. Israel is not one of them. Israel is, I think, the biggest beneficiary of overseas development aid in the United States. So they can turn off that fa faucet. They they can say they can they have a lot of influence on Israel that goes beyond Biden, um, uh, you know, uh, criticizing them mildly, you know. So it, it depends on the country. If we're talking about uh, about another uh, a country that's far away and that's small and that doesn't have resources, and we don't have great expectations that they'll do anything other than be politically um, politically supportive. I mean, we in the last week, we had a, a resolution of the Security Council. 13 states voted in favor of a resolution on the ceasefire, and one of them abstained. Only one of them was against it. We had a vote in the General Assembly following on the United for Peace resolution, I think, yesterday. And the vote was something like 150 in favor, which is which is greater 
than anything obtained in the United Nations Secure uh, General Assembly with regard to Ukraine and Russia, for example. So it shows a high level of of, of unanimity globally on on this issue, and uh, you know something's gotta gotta give. My my hope is that out of this, because sometimes it's out of the dire conflict like this, that the solutions actually do emerge. And perhaps because Israel is incapable of defeating Hamas, I think that's becoming increasingly clear. They can't defeat them. So if we stop them ethnically cleansing the Palestinians, they're going to have to do something else. And doing something else should be resolving resolving the crisis by creating a Palestinian state that's fully sovereign. Thanks, Lina. I've got two more questions. I think they'll be quite quick. Uh, what about what what happens if states invoke the genocide convention at the ICJ, and and could it be done? And what what does it require for a state to actually invoke it at the ICJ? I don't know if you yes. heard, but our, our, our common friend Daniel Makova mentioned this recently in an interview, saying that states should or could in, in, you know, invoke this. Yes, I mean it's been discussed actually since early October uh, as a, a, an available option. The Genocide Convention, which is ratified by almost 155 countries in the world, including Israel and Palestine, has a clause in it which gives jurisdiction to the International Court of Justice. The people don't always understand that the International Court of Justice, although all UN members are member are members of the court. So Israel's a member. It's it's a member of the of the International Court of Justice, but they don't. The court can't exercise jurisdiction over them unless they make an agreement. Unless with the, they, it requires a an additional consent from the state to accept the jurisdiction of the court. Not the majority of states have not done this. Uh, I think only seventy or so have done it, uh, and Israel's not one of them. But there are also agreements, there are clauses in individual treaties, including the Genocide Convention, that enable the International Court of Justice to exercise jurisdiction. And so of, of the 155, 54 members of the Genocide Convention, the vast majority, I think about 140 of them, have accepted the jurisdiction of the court for a dispute about genocide. And that includes both Israel and Palestine. So Palestine could sue Israel at the International Court of Justice. Now, the, the first line of defense for Israel, if that were to happen, would be to argue that Palestine is not a state and cannot legitimately be a party to the Genocide Convention. We would have that debate. The judges would rule on it. We'd see what the answer is. Um, it may be that Palestine is reluctant to engage in that dispute, um, and, and this may explain why Palestine hasn't filed uh, an application against Israel at the court. But it's also possible for what we call a third state, another state that's a party to the Genocide Convention, to file an application against Israel. And um, there have been, you know, rumblings of it. This has already happened uh, in the case of the case that, that the Gambia filed against Myanmar uh, four years ago. And so it's it's been recognized it's possible. And you just need now a willing state that wants to have a big fight with Israel at the International Court of Justice, or a group of them could do it. And there's also a growing phenomenon. There's there's a, a growing phenomenon of states being prepared to take on these battles at the International Court of Justice, and also to do it in a collective way where they get a group of states to, to file an application or to support an application. So that's all quite, quite doable. Um, you know, based on the case law of the International Court of Justice, it's had two major judgments on the Genocide Convention. Um, it, it would be a hard battle at this stage to win a case on the merits of a genocide claim at the International Court of Justice. But one of the things at the International Court of Justice that's very um, interesting is that they they quite readily issue what are called provisional measures orders. Um they will have an initial skirmish at the court, and the threshold for granting this is relatively low. They're, they're, it's, it's relatively easy to get a provisional measures order at the International Court of Justice, much harder to win the case on the merits. 
And so a state that would file a case against Israel would have an initial skirmish. Israel would send its lawyers there. They'd have a fight in the court. And I think there's a high likelihood that the court would issue a provisional measures order that would probably be directed. Typically, also, they direct them at both parties, calling on them to stop fighting, uh, to stop firing missiles at one another. But clearly, it would be directed at Israel. Um, and so I, I can't forecast precisely what the court would decide. But I think that it would be there's a likelihood of a real initial victory on that at the International Court of Justice. But as I said, it, it would require a state to want to take that up. There's also, I think, some concern that there's another case about Palestine and Israel that's actually proceeding before the International Court of Justice. And this is the advisory opinion on uh, the occupation of Palestine that was requested um, of the International Court of Justice by the General Assembly at the end of December last year. And it's scheduled for hearing in the middle of February. So it was all planned, and I think it was even, the hearing was scheduled before the recent uh, conflict erupted. But obviously, when states go there in February to to talk about the case, to argue it, the the events, the ongoing conflict is going to be very much at the forefront. So there's there's already a legal debate that we're headed towards on this. And that's not based on the genocide convention, the the, the advisory opinion. It's a much broader, uh, a much broader issue, and uh, of, but of course it's not seeking a final judgment that would directly condemn Israel, but it it could do so indirectly. Thank you. My final question: um, a lot of activists, a lot of people think that this moment that started, you know, October seventh. Uh, is going to change everything that we, you know, the way we think about Israel, Palestine, the, 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 what's happening on the ground is never going to be the same after these last few, um, like eight weeks. Um, so anyway, what's your, your opinion on this, both in a way as a legal expert, but also as someone that has worked on Israel, Palestine for, for, for decades, once again, do you think there's, there will be an after, like a before and an after? Let's call it October 7th, even if I don't like that. But anyway. Well, you know, you're asking me to predict the future. And I think Mark Twain said there's nothing harder to predict than the future, you know. Um, but it's clearly a, a, a kind of a defining moment, I think. It, it's, the likelihood is that it will be a defining moment in the way that the previous conflicts in Gaza, the one in 2014, the one in 2009, were not. They were more. Um, you know, I don't want to call them skirmishes because there were there were many deaths and they were quite quite brutal. But they were, you know, I, I think the IDF, you know, they're reported to use this expression mowing the mowing the grass, cutting the grass. That that was it, it was more of a part of a reality of the relationship between Gaza as what was still essentially an occupied territory, and uh, but with Israel not actually on the territory but surrounding it. And this is changing, obviously changing all of that. Um, we hear we hear Israelis talking about how they're just waiting to get into Gaza so they can start building stuff. And, uh, you know, it, it's, you know, the 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 likelihood of a of a truly tragic outcome. It, it, the, 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 that's a, a very real possibility that they, they will open. There will be some agreement uh, with the Egyptians. Uh, who will be paid off in some way, maybe by the Saudis or something, that there'll be some uh, benefit that you know, that makes it acceptable for the Egyptians. It wouldn't be the first time they would have weakened the cause of the Palestinians in their history. And uh, so that could happen. Uh, and then Israel would take over Gaza and, you know, European tourists will be going to spend their holidays on the beach in Gaza in, 20, in 10 years' time in big hotels built by Israelis. That could happen. Um, alternatively, it could be a halt, and then there would be political change, perhaps in Israel, pressure from abroad, and they will finally have to accept what has been in the, you know, in the cards and debated since since uh, since Oslo in the early 1990s. That is a proper 
Palestinian state. I think that if Palestine has a proper state with with secure borders, there won't be any more rocket attacks. That'll be the end of it. And, and we'll be able to get on with it. And the people on both sides will be able to live in in peace. And that would be the hope. Strange things emerge out of terrible wars. And uh, that's been the history of humanity. So I don't know. And, and, and of course, I, I hope for the best. But I do fear the worst as well. Thanks a lot, Bill, uh, again, for your time. Uh, very interesting and, and challenging thoughts. Thanks. Nice to talk to you. Bye-bye, Frank. Bye-bye, Bill.